I'm Alan Gravel, I'm the board chairman of the Atlanta Vietnam Veterans Business Association Foundation, and we welcome you here today. Appreciate you coming. As is our custom with the um, with AVBBA events, we want to start today with the Pledge of Allegiance. So, if you'd all stand, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Be seated. You didn't come to hear me talk, so we'll keep this short. But um, I do have a few things I need to say. Um, one is that uh, early on in putting this together, we were able to believe in the possibility of it because Atlanta History Center stepped up and made this venue available for us and we thank them very much. The second person who, a uh, second organization that stepped up and gave us a green light head forward was Sonobas when they uh, generously contributed to um, allow us to hold this uh, symposium without utilizing any of our funds that are earmarked for memorials or for uh, scholarships or Iraq and Afghanistan veterans. So we appreciate their participation. Corporate values of Chick-fil-A are so well known that I doubt any of you are surprised that they're furnishing lunch today. <laughs> Not reluctantly or begrudgingly, but generously and with re revealing a deep commitment to the values that made this country great. <clears throat> we wouldn't be here today without the help of our speakers and our moderator. R.J. Del Vecchio with the Vietnam Veterans of Factual History, and the, the speakers Bob Turner, Michael Court, and Mark Moyer. No amount of money or coercion or persuasion could get these men to travel as they have to come here unless they were deeply committed to the accuracy of history and to helping to uh, correct some of the myths about the Vietnam War. We thank them very much. And lastly, um, many members of AVBBA have helped to put this thing together and other organizations, and I can't name all of you, but I, I have to name a few people. And first of all, Jim Dixon, and then Rod Knowles, John Butler, Bob Hopkins. Those are, have participated. <laughs> They've worked hard for four or five months putting this together. So without further ado, I want to introduce our moderator, R.J. Del Vecchio with the, Atlanta, uh, the Vietnam Veterans for Factual History, and he will run the show for us today. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Uh, actually, I want to depart for a moment. I'm at the age where finding myself standing amongst a bunch of people who stand up and say the Pledge of Allegiance is still heartwarming. And uh, it reminded me of something. I do a lot of high school lectures. And uh, last fall, I was at a high school, and we were saying the Pledge of Allegiance, and one student did not stand up in the front row. and just sat there. And I looked at her and didn't say anything. Later, she came up to me because she wanted to assure me she didn't mean to disrespect me. And I said, thank you very much, but why would you not stand and say it? She said, well, because I'm not a hypocrite. And I said, how is it hypocritical? She said, well, we don't have perfect liberty and justice for all. And I thought for a second, I said, well, of course, you're exactly right. We didn't have perfect liberty and justice for all in 1776. We didn't have it yesterday. We don't have it today. We won't have it tomorrow. By the way, what nation anywhere at any time ever has? We are human beings. We are fallible. If your criteria for what's okay is perfection, you're going to be disappointed. What's important is what is good. And this country is good. When we say the Pledge of Allegiance, it's not an arrogant claim of our perfection. It's a statement of our ideals, of what we work towards, what we've always worked towards and made progress for, for the last 200 some odd years, 
and we're still making progress towards it. And I said, there's so much more in our history that we should look at and acknowledging our flaws and faults and mistakes and imperfections, there's so much more to look at that we can take pride in rather than shame. And this country is worthy of our respect, our affection, and for some of us even, our love. And therefore, I'd like you to reconsider the next time you want to hear about the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, uh, ladies, uh, gentlemen, fellow veterans, welcome guests, all gentle beings, good morning. Kin chao kui vi. We are here as guests of the AVBA Foundation as part of their continued service to the nation. A lot of us veterans remember that we took an oath to support the country, our nation, and we're still involved in doing that, and probably will be until they put us in a box and stow us away someplace. Uh, they want to provide well-founded inputs on the history of the Vietnam War. Every major human event ends up with you know, being described in later times across a range of ways. Uh, and after all, huge events like wars have layers of complexities. So different people will examine different aspects offered from different viewpoints. Perceptions and biases will affect what is thought and written. Sometimes there's room to see the same event in different ways, even when good people consider the same set of facts. But there's always the possibility of misperceptions, biases, incomplete information, and inaccuracies entering into the accounts that are drawn up. And arguments arise about what is the truest version of history. The most significant event of the 20th century was World War II a war with perhaps the simplest and clearest moral imperative ever known. Yet there's been a bitter dispute among historians, among a few, over the use of atomic bombs during the Pacific War, in which some tried to prove it was unnecessary and the worst war crime ever, and that Harry Truman was a terrible war criminal. This was a, a eventually effectively rebutted by the facts as shown not in Allied records, but in the records of the Japanese Imperial Council. But it was interesting that that debate went on for a while. In fact, there's still some people who still hang on to it, even though the data from the Japanese are perfectly clear. The conflict in Vietnam certainly had its complexities and has been reported and written about by a large host of people with a very wide range of viewpoints, often from those who had strong emotional positions on what they perceived, sometimes from those who had been very active in their opposition to or support of the war. The strong emotions of the time, which was also a time when other major cultural changes were taking place in the nation, were inflamed by dramatic images of all sorts. Men executed in the streets, monks burning themselves up, little girls running naked and burned by napalm, all kinds of destruction, POWs signaling torture with their eyes, a war brought right to everyone's living room. How to make sense of all this now? The only answer, even acknowledging that people can interpret the same facts differently, to try to go to the most solid, verifiable facts that you can find. Forget all the things that everyone knows. Put aside the dramatic images and look for the facts as best they can be found and examine how those who have done the careful research and who appear to be reasoningly as objectively as possible have done their analyses. Today you will hear from three of the most qualified professional historians there are in the field. As they speak, you may have questions to come to your mind that you would like to have them answer. Please fill out the question cards that are available. We only need your name and which presenter, if you pick one that you wish to question, and the questions. Uh, after the lunch break, we will reconvene and go through the questions and answers and provide responses. Some of the comments we not only have the three distinguished historians we'll be presenting today here, we have a number of other historians here, both American born and Vietnamese born. So some questions you may, write, may bring up later this afternoon might be answered by someone else who's even closer to that subject. Also, I think it's important to understand this was not our war. This was the war between South Vietnam and North Vietnam, in which the South had no designs in the North, but the North was determined to conquer the South under the banner of communism. We were allied with the South, but while 58,000 Americans died in the conflict, over 250,000 South Vietnamese military died. 
Many more were wounded, and tens of thousands of civilians were assassinated as part of the terror campaigns. We only have a few books from Southeast authors which present their own view of events, and they certainly deserve to be considered as well. With that, I will thank you for coming, and all of the AVVBA groups for having the initiative to set this up and all the work that members have done to make this a reality. Your first speaker is Dr. Robert Turner, who has a truly unique set of experiences and qualifications. He published his first commentary on the Vietnam War as a letter to the editor in the Paris edition of the New York Times in August 1964. We're talking way back, okay? Um, he wrote a 450-page undergraduate honors thesis on the war in 1966-67. He was the director of research for the National Student Committee for Victory of Vietnam. He took part in more than 100 debates, teaching and panels. He doesn't take part in many of them anymore because nobody on the other side is willing to get anywhere near him in a debate. Uh, he spent five different periods in Vietnam between 68 and 75, right to the end. Served twice in the air as an Army Lieutenant and a Captain on detail for MACV in the North Vietnamese Viet Cong Affairs Division of the American Embassy. He's written several books on the war, many articles, presentations, and again, nobody wants to argue with him. Uh, we, we had a conference uh, held by uh, VVFH a couple of years ago in D.C. We invited all kinds of famous anti-war people to participate. And we heard back, we're, we're still waiting to hear back. Uh, with that, I will turn you over to Dr. Robert Turner. First of all, to all of the Vietnam veterans in the group, thanks for your service and welcome home. I have an unusual perspective on Vietnam, uh, having spent years in the early days of the war traveling around the country and debating professors and leaders of SDS and other organizations. I was involved in over 100 debates and similar programs. Every time I heard the same litany of arguments, all of which were false, save for the argument that war is a horrible thing and good people get killed in war. So nobody likes war. But if you don't stand up to aggression, we learned at Munich uh, that the cost could be far greater once you empower the aggressors. Uh, it's, there was a big debate in the 1960s over whether we were protecting South Vietnam from foreign aggression or interfering in a civil war and propping up a dictator and so forth. The good news is uh, that's no longer debatable. After Hanoi published its official history of the war, translated into English by a member of the Vietnam Veterans for Factual History, uh, there cannot be any question. They documented in tremendous detail that on May 19th, 1959, Ho Chi Minh's birthday, uh, Hanoi made a decision to open the Ho Chi Minh Trail and start pouring troops, supplies, and equipment and weapons down through Laos and Cambodia into South Vietnam, down the Ho Chi Minh Trail. This was as much aggression as any other war we have ever fought, even though it was covertly well, covert aggression. It was not until five years later, on August 7th, 1964, that Congress enacted the equivalent to a declaration of war, what we today call an authorization for the use of military force, empowering the president to use <clears throat> armed force as he did deem necessary to protect the protocol states of the 1955 CETO Treaty. Those states were the state of Vietnam, which we knew as South Vietnam, Laos and Cambodia. That's right. Congress authorized the use of force in Cambodia at the time it did Vietnam, despite the fact that critics complained when we sent troops into Cambodia, which helped us, helped us win the war. Some people tried to argue, wait a minute, Vietnam was only temporarily divided at the Geneva Conference, and so it was perfectly permissible for one zone to use force to re reunite the country. 
So that doesn't do very well when we recall the Korean War. On June 25th, 1950, North Korea invaded South Korea. Uh, the United Nations Security Council met, denounced it as an international aggression, and empowered the United States to lead an international force under the UN flag to protect South Korea. The, uh, you cannot make a credible legal case that the Vietnam War was either unconstitutional or illegal. Uh, and uh, if you have doubts about that, our center hosted a conference on April 29th, 19, sorry, 2000, on 25th anniversary of the fall of Saigon. And we decided we would repeat the old Vietnam debates. And so we contacted the very best international law and constitutional law scholars who had opposed the war back in the 60s and said, hey, let's get together and re-argue those issues. But in light of the evidence we now have, what Hanoi has provided us. We went more than six deep in each area before anybody would touch it. Uh, they can't make the case. We did finally find two very lightweight people to debate it. And this book has the transcript of those debates. I, I debated the uh, constitutional law issues. My opponent made an opening statement, and when his time for rebuttal came, uh, he basically said, that's all I've got. Uh, it, it's just, you know, the idea that it was an illegal war is absolutely wrong. Now, another major point, we did not lose the Vietnam War on the battlefields of Vietnam. Indeed, we did not lose a single major battle during the war. This is less a commentary of the lack of uh, courage and uh, 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 ability of our opponents than it was in the fact that we had superior air power and any time they decided to stay and fight, we clobbered them and we, and, and we, you know, we, we, uh, we destroyed them. But uh, by 1968, the National Liberation Front slash Viet Cong, which had been a creature of Hanoi from the beginning, virtually ceased to exist. They had been destroyed by the Tet Offensive and the May 1968 Offensive. An old late friend of mine, Harry Summers, wrote a book called On Strategy. And in the beginning, he opens with this exchange. You know you're never defeated us on the battlefield, the American colonel said. And that colonel was Harry Summers, by the way. The North Vietnamese colonel responded, that may be so, but it's also irrelevant. And both men were right. I worked in the North Vietnam Viet Cong Affairs Division of the embassy during my two military tours. They created a job called Assistant Special Projects Officer for me. And Douglas Pike worked in that same office three times. We alternated between the two of us. And Doug wrote, I believe future historians will say not only could the war have been won, but that we had it won. Bill Colby, an old and dear friend, well, he was the CIA station chief in Saigon in the late 1950s, came back and, and very, it was, he was a number three civilian in Vietnam throughout much of the war, went on to be the director of central intelligence, the head of the CIA. He wrote a wonderful book called Lost Victory, and he used to come down every year to speak to my Vietnam War seminar at UVA Law School. And he noted that the big test was the Spring 72 Offensive, also known as the Easter Offensive, although not by the North Vietnamese. They didn't care much about Easter. But Bill Colby says, on the ground in South Vietnam, the war had been won. And I think he is exactly right. That's a photo of Bill and my colleague, John Norton Moore, who was the leading international law scholar supporting the war. Another old, fr old friend of mine, Robert Elegant, wrote a fascinating article called How to Lose a War. You can find it if you Google that title. It's been uh, copied and put on the internet. And he says, South Vietnam and American forces actually won the limited military struggle. John Lewis Gaddis is a professor of history at Yale. He wrote a two-part series for foreign affairs. And he said, historians now acknowledge American counterinsurgency operations in Vietnam were succeeding during the final years of the war. Sadly, we lost the support of the American people and that was not enough. 
John Gaddis is often referred to as the Dean of American Diplomatic Historians. After the war ended, Hanoi admitted it had lost more than a million troops in the war, nearly four times the total loss of the South Vietnamese, American, and Allied forces combined. Now, why was it important to go to war to protect South Vietnam from communist aggression? After World War II, General Eisenhower was concerned that the American people would not tolerate spending large sums of money on uh, military. And he decided <coughs> to cut back our ground forces, where we were already overwhelmingly overpowered by the Soviet Empire. They had far several times more tanks than we had, more artillery pieces, more divisions. Uh, but Ike said after Korea, we don't want to match China man for man in a land war in China. What we want to do is deter war. And we're going to do that by responding to, to future aggression at a time and manner of our own choice. And Mr. Khrushchev, in case you're not listening, Look around Moscow and see what you want to see glowing for the half-life of uranium-235. Don't mess with us. And it worked with Khrushchev. He backed down. He said, now is not the time for armed struggle. But that's where our friend Mao Zedong comes in. And also, the other thing that came in is Eisenhower's strategy worked great when we had an overwhelming preponderance of nuclear power. But the, the communists, they had a few nuclear weapons, but nothing that could match us. But as Moscow's arsenal increased, then the issue became, is America really going to trade New York and Chicago and Atlanta to save Saigon? And that was very dubious. But Mao came along and said, yes, in appearance, the imperialists are very fierce. But we are going to use people's warfare, what Moscow called wars of national liberation. We are going to send in advisors and money and weapons to train guerrillas who will then fight among the people. They would live among the people, work among the people, and when appropriate, take up arms and fight. So if you decide to use nuclear weapons for every guerrilla you kill, you're going to kill hundreds of totally innocent people. The Americans are not that foolish, and their allies are not that foolish. They would never tolerate that. And thus, Mao said, nuclear weapons are irrelevant. And Vietnam became a test case of this. Indeed, Lin Pao, the uh, vice chair of the Central Committee of the Chinese Communist Party, wrote a very important, uh, gave a very important speech that was published in a document called Long Live the Victory of People's Wars, in which he said, the future of the world revolution will be determined on the battlefields of Vietnam. He said, once the Vietnamese have proven that American counterinsurgency te techniques will not work, then we will have many Vietnams all over the third world. Che Guevara, uh, Fidel Castro's top military advisor, said the future of the struggle for the revolutionary struggle in the Americas will be decided on the battlefields of Vietnam. Moscow and Beijing had a big feud going on at this point. And one of the issues was whether it was appropriate to move to armed struggle. Khrushchev said no, Mao said yes. Had we walked away from Vietnam in 1964, 1965, we would have proven that Mao was right, that we did not have an answer to these kinds of, uh, of threats, and we might actually have seen the reunification of the communist empire with Moscow saying, okay, we don't have to worry about American intervention. <coughs> Throughout the Third World, there were dissident groups who wanted power. If they saw that by siding with the communists they could get power, they would think, okay, we'll get their money and their guns and their training, and then when we get power, we'll throw them out. Never happened that way, because the communists always made sure they got the key ministries, like the defense ministry and the treasury. Uh, the interior, of course, in this country, the interior department takes care of our national parks, in most of the world, it's the internal police. And there's not a single case where a group accepted the aid of a communist and the communist did not come out on top after victory. Now, another point I'm not going to dwell on, but very important, we fought most of the Vietnam War with one hand tied behind our backs. Uh, and that totally undermined deterrence 
it encouraged Hanoi, it demoralized the hell out of our troops, and it turned many Americans against the war. In 1968, in the New Hampshire primary, uh, McCarthy almost got a majority of the votes. It shocked everyone. It led LBJ to decide not to run for re-election. And it later turned out that a majority of the people who voted for McCarthy went on to vote for George Wallace and Curtis LeMay. They were super hawks casting protest votes for our, over our no-win policies in Indochina. Another old friend of mine, Bob Elegant, and Bob and I were on a panel at the Texas Tech Vietnam Center that Steve Sherman put, to, put together, I think two years ago, talking about the media in Vietnam. And Bob wrote an excellent article uh, called uh, How to Lose a War. If you, if you Google that title in quotes, uh, you'll find it's been put on the internet uh, by at least two groups. And it is a, 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 a damnation of the, the role of the media at undermining public support for the war. Uh, and candidly, I shared that view. There were some outstanding journalists in Vietnam uh, but there also were an awful lot of hacks that had no idea what was going on. Uh, and there were a number of people who went there because they thought the war was a horrible thing. We can discuss this more during Q&A. Now, it's important to understand Hanoi's strategy. They understood they could not defeat the United States military in a war. And they never intended to. They had a multifaceted struggle. See, Americans tend to think that if you've got a military problem, you go to the Pentagon, an economic problem, maybe you go to Treasury, uh, uh, Commerce. Uh, the communists understood that struggle is like, a, is like an orchestra. You've got your percussion and your strings and your, wind and your, your, your horns and so forth. You play them all together. And they understood that in addition to the military struggle, there is also the political struggle which was critical in Vietnam. When they went to war against France in 1947, the Viet Minh had a very effective propaganda campaign inside France, telling the French people to oppose the war, to, you know, to block troop trains and, and so forth. And they defeated the French. They won the Battle of Dien Bien Phu in the sense that they overran it, but they suffered several times more fatalities than the French did, even counting the French troops who died on the forced march back to Hanoi. Uh, to say that, that Dien Vinh Phu was in any meaningful sense a military victory for the Viet Minh is simply not true. But it was an incredible political defeat. It brought down the Linnell government in Paris. The Chinese advised, the whole game here was logistics. Everybody knew, I mean, Dien Vinh Phu was surrounded by mountains. But it was all triple canopy jungle and so forth. There's no way you could get artillery in there. And thus, small arms fire was not going to have an effect you know, on the base. You might occasionally pick someone off, but you're shooting at, you know, a mile away or so. But Jap organized tens of thousands of laborers. They built roads. They took apart artillery pieces and strapped them onto bicycles and so forth. And it was a brilliant logistics move. They put the artillery the Chinese had given them after, after China fell to, to, to Mao, and they put it on a direct fire mode, firing straight down the mountain into the airfield. The Bin Phu was totally dependent upon aviation for resupply. Once you put a few big craters in that landing in that airfield, nobody's going to land there more than once, let's put it that way. And so the Viet Minh dug tunnels to right outside the French perimeter. And when the French dropped, uh, you know, parachuted in supplies, as often as not, it missed the target and a hand went up and dragged it down and the Viet Minh had dinner for two weeks. Uh, the game was over. Les jours sont faits, as the French say. And then the, the Chinese military advisors say, hold it, job, hold it, wait, we will tell you when to, just, to take the camp. And French and, and European newspapers, day after day, front page stories, Dien Bien Phu still holds on. And the, night, the day before the Geneva Conference, which had been discussing Korea, took up Indochina, they overran Dien Bien Phu. Banner headline, Dien Bien Phu Falls. 
uh, Lonell government fails, Pierre Mendes France, a socialist, worked with the communists and get, set up a coalition after promising to bring peace in Indochina within 30 days or he would resign his position. Uh, the reason they beat the French was because of political warfare. Now, I talk about this in my 1975 book, uh, uh, Vietnamese Communism. If you can find a copy of that, you're luckier than I am. It's, uh, there are not a lot of copies out there, but I, uh, uh, it has a lot of, uh, of information on this whole history. Uh, they did the same thing to us. They used propaganda. Moscow, Beijing, uh, Havana all helped in. And I heard these same arguments at virtually every debate and program. The U.S. first got involved to re restore French colonial rule after World War II. Absolutely not true. We actually prohibited American merchant ships from carrying troops or supplies from France to Vietnam. We favored liberation or the, the freedom, the end of colonial rule. Uh, they said that we violated the Geneva Accords. Not true at all. We didn't sign anything at Geneva, nor did South Vietnam, on the issue of the so-called reunification elections in 1956. Our position spelled out very clearly was that we would only support elections if they were supervised by the United Nations to ensure that they were conducted fairly. You have to remember that North Vietnam got a majority of the population. Molotov, the head of the Soviet delegation and co-chair of the Geneva Conference, said that would be interfering in the internal affairs of the Vietnamese people to have supervision. Ho actually had some bogus elections in the North where there were soldiers at the voting booths to help people mark their ballots. Indeed, China was funding guerrillas and training